Today, we're going to be talking about gravity some more. And so, so far in the class, we've seen that the force of gravity is equal to mg. And so if we had our person standing on the earth, then they felt the force pointing down on them for gravity. It's going to turn out that this equation is really just an approximation. And so now we'll introduce the full version of Newtonian gravity. So this force of gravity looks like this. And so maybe I'll do this in different colors. And so I'll draw a picture for what this looks like. Let's say, for example, that you had, maybe this is the Earth. And this is the moon that orbits the Earth. So obviously, the Earth has some mass. And we're going to call that M1 for now. And then the moon has some mass M2. So this is the mass of object one. This is the mass of object two. R is going to be the distance from the center of mass but, uh, between these two objects. So you'll see that there's this, uh, so this is the, distance between both objects. So I wrote this is r hat. And so this is a unit vector. So we've seen unit vectors before. So we've seen i hat went with the x direction, j hat went with the y direction, and now r hat is just gonna go in the radial direction. So radial meaning if you are so for example, the moon is orbiting the earth in a circular orbit, and we'll talk about that in a second. Then the radial direction is pointing basically, I guess I'll draw, I'll draw another picture on the next slide. 
but we'll, we'll come back to that. And so in this example, if R is the distance between these two points, then depending on which object we're looking at, the force acting on So the force of gravity of the moon acting on the earth is gonna be pointing in this direction, right? Because the, the moon is exerting a gravitational force on the earth. And then the force of gravity of the earth acting on the moon is gonna point the other direction. And so what these, what this R hat vector is telling you is that you point along the direction uh, that is the distance between those two objects. Yes. What does this, is that, what, E, where is, oh, uh, right. These are moon, moon acting on the earth. And so this is also an example of Newton's third law, right? Even though the Earth has more mass than the moon, the force that the Earth pulls on the moon is the same as the force that the moon pulls on the Earth. So the last thing that we haven't talked about is this G. And this G is called the gravitational constant. And I'll show you what that is on the next slide. So any questions about this so far? Okay. So that capital G, which we said was the gravitational constant, is this value. And then if we wanna look at the units, we can determine the units ourselves by looking at all of these, all of the units of everything else in the problem. So we want to end up with units of Newton because it's a gravitational force. So whatever unit this G has to have will be uh, something that gives you a kilogram squared or that'll cancel a kilogram squared and a meter squared on the bottom. So if you solve for the units of G, it would be Newton meter squared over kilogram squared. So you could also expand out what a, a Newton is. So a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. 
So if I multiply that by meters squared over kilograms squared, then I would end up with your one of your kilograms canceling out and you'd have meters cubed over kilograms seconds squared. So usually you're not going to be writing the units of this thing, but uh, the units are such that when you multiply it by a two masses and divide it by a radius squared, then you'll get the units of force. So this is this is just a like this is something that we can measure, um, but it's not. So this is an example of just like a universal physics constant. So it's not something that you can necessarily derive. It's something that you would have to measure. Yeah. And on like a test or something, I would give you this constant. Okay, so if we look at the, so if we go back to our picture, so let's say we have the earth. And the moon. And the moon is orbiting the Earth. Then we said that this direction from the center of the Earth to the center of the moon. So we said that this distance was R. And so this direction would be R hat direction. So anytime you have a circle like this, the radial direction points uh, perpendicularly outward from the circle. And then we have another direction that points this way. So ten, uh, perpendicular to the circle is radial direction. And then this direction is called the tangential direction. So I'll draw these two vectors at a couple different places along the circle so you can see what they look like. So this is a new kind of coordinate system. So if we had, you could just use your regular x, y coordinate system if you want. But then as you can see, as you go around the circle, this r, uh, maybe I'll draw r for each of these different points. So you'll see that this R 
if you use x, y coordinates would be pointing in, sometimes it would be pointing in the x direction, sometimes it would be pointing in the y direction, sometimes it would be pointing in both. So if you left your coordinate system like this x, y system, you'd have to do a lot of extra math to like break your force into components and work like that. So instead we can just define a coordinate system uh, where we use the radial and the tangential directions instead. And so that's what this, when I wrote the force of gravity like this, that's what this R hat is doing. It's telling us that we're, this force is directed in the radial direction. So that is kind of implying that we're using this radial and tangential coordinate system. So any questions about this so far? Okay. So uh, when I started out, I said that uh, this was just an approximation. And so let's show that this, equals this when M1 equals the mass of the Earth. And R equals the radius of the Earth. And then I'm just gonna rewrite instead of M2, I'm just gonna, well, maybe I'll, I'll leave this M2 and then we'll put M2 over here. So M2 is the mass of whatever object is on the surface of the earth. Uh, and then, like I said, M1 will be the mass of the earth, R will be the radius of the earth. And G we said was 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. Newton meters squared over kilograms, whatever those units were, kilograms squared. Now the mass of the earth is 5.97 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. Let me check. Yes, and then the radius of the Earth is 6.37 times 10 to the six meters. So you should see that there's a an M2 on both sides. So we're gonna ignore that. And then our goal now is basically to show that G times M1 over R squared has to equal little g, which is 9.81. So I'll have you guys plug these numbers into your calculator and check that that is in fact the case. So what did people get? Did they get 9.8, right? So uh, that's just kind of a confirmation that 
what we had previously is consistent with this new interpretation that we're using. And this new interpretation that we're using is important for uh, things orbiting the Earth or uh, basically any time you get sufficiently far away from the Earth that uh, your uh, so on the surface of the Earth. If you're just standing on top of it, then your distance from the center of the Earth is just the radius of the Earth. But say if you were in an airplane, that is a lovely drawing, I know. Now your distance from the Earth is not or your distance from the center of the earth is not just r, it's going to be r plus whatever, say, altitude you have above the earth. And so if your altitude is some fraction of the radius of the earth, then uh, you would see that your uh, gravitational acceleration is going to decrease from the 9.8 that you feel on the surface of the Earth. So if altitude is, and it could even be just like 1% of the radius of the Earth. Then you would see that your, if you calculated little g, it would be less than 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, so we've shown now that this new interpretation of gravity that we're using is the same or is consistent with the previous uh, formulation of gravity that we were using. And so this equation is still what you should use when you're doing projectile motion or anything close to the surface of the earth. And this formulation is what you should use when you're doing something orbiting or any space stuff like trying to launch rockets or something like that. And so if you want to think about this from a historical point of view, uh, this MG interpretation would have been what people were using for since the time that people realized that things that you throw up in the air fall back down to the time when Newton came along and said, well, that's true for stuff happening on Earth, but there's a more complex formula that we need for things that are happening in space. And then that lasted for a few hundred years. And then Einstein came along and said, well, that's really just also an approximation and you need to use general relativity to actually describe what's happening in space. So this is kind of the, the progress of science. You keep making models and it works for all the situations you see, but then you encounter new situations and you need a better model. And then you keep refining your models until you have something that works in all of the situations that you encounter. 
So let's keep working on this uh, orbital motion. So if this is the Earth and this was the moon, or it could be a sat some other satellite. A conceptual way to think about this orbit So if we had just this force of gravity, I guess I'll draw it this way. So if we're looking at the force acting on the moon, then it's experiencing a force of gravity that's pointed radially towards the Earth. If this was the only thing that was happening in this system, what would happen to the moon? Right, so if there were no other forces going on, there was no other motion, then the moon would just follow the direction of the force and it would hit the earth and that would be bad. We would all be dead and there would be no life. Um, that's not what's happening. So instead, the moon has some tangential velocity. And so if we think about our kinematic equations, if we have a force that's pointed radially, then we would have some acceleration that's also pointed radially, right? So this force of gravity is also gonna imply some radial acceleration. So if I, add or so like we said if there were no other nothing else going on the moon would fall in towards the center of the earth so that radial acceleration is causing some initial velocity to go down towards the earth right but we've seen that you can add, if I add this tangential velocity with whatever velocity is pointing radially towards the center of the earth, I would get some kind of, uh, so let's add the radial part like that. I would get some velocity that's a combination of those two separate velocities, right? And so instead of the moon falling straight down or continuing along the straight tangential velocity direction, it's instead pointed to some other point along the circle. And so if you repeat this kind of uh, vector addition process all the way around the circle, you'll see that the moon is continually trying to fall to the earth, but as the, because it has some tangential velocity, it basically keeps missing the earth. So one way to think about orbit is that you're continually missing the earth. So another way to think about that is if I were standing on the earth and I threw some projectile, it would travel away from the earth and then it would fall back down, right? 
if I keep throwing it harder, then I would keep getting closer to, I would keep moving farther away from myself. And eventually I could throw it hard enough. Well, not, you can't physically throw it hard enough, but you could launch something with a high enough initial velocity that it keeps missing the earth as it goes around. And now you're orbiting the earth. So that's what, that's conceptually what we're doing with satellites is we're blasting something off of the earth at a high enough velocity such that its projectile motion makes it orbit the earth instead of falling back down to the earth. So any conceptual questions about that? So this phenomena is called uniform circular motion. And it not only happens with orbiting objects, but you can see it on Earth as well. So If we stick with our Earth example, and the moon, we said that this direction pointing out from the circle was the radial direction. And this direction that's Tangent to the circle is the tangential direction. Uh, another thing, another term that we'll use is, uh, so if radial is pointing out of the circle, then we have, you could call this the negative radial direction. Or you'll see it called the centrip. I always spell it wrong. Is it a T or a T? Centripetal. And so we have a relationship between the tangential velocity and the centripetal acceleration. And it looks like this. And so before we go back to the earth and moon system, uh, if we come back to the, on the ground and you have someone who's, for example, uh, maybe you have like a rock tied to a rope and you're swinging that rock above your head in a circular motion. Let's see if I can draw this better. So in black will be the rock on the string and then in motion 
it would be, it would follow this path in red. So the radius of the circle is R. And let's say R is, Zero point five meters, and if we know what the velocity of that rock is, say two meters per second, then we could calculate the centripetal acceleration two squared over zero point five. So that would be eight meters per second squared. And so let's just to make this easier, let's pretend that the only force acting on this object uh, would be the tension force of the string. Then you would write your Newton's second law equation as uh, the sum of the forces in the centripetal direction equals mac. If we're pretending that the only force acting on this is tension, uh, then you would see that your tension force equals MAC. And if we said that the mass of the rock was five kilograms, then we could calculate what tension force you would, the rope would be exerting on the rock in order to keep it moving in this circular path uh, by multiplying our centripetal acceleration and our mass. So five times eight, 40 newtons. Yes. And so now if we go back to our picture with uh, orbital motion, uh, we can do some interesting things with this uh, centripetal acceleration and the force of gravity that we already wrote down. So gravity centripetal. So in the case of the Earth and the Moon orbiting the Earth, we know that the Moon is orbiting in a circle. So we know that it has to have a centripetal acceleration. And we know that the only force between the Earth and the Moon is the gravitational force. Then our sum of the forces equals MAC. There's only the gravitational force. So G, M, Earth, M, Moon. squared equals, and then this, the M on the right-hand side is gonna be the moon mass times the centripetal acceleration. And you'll remember that we know that the centripetal acceleration is Vt squared over R. So if we plug that in, Now you'll see that there's some things on both sides of the equation that we can cancel out. We can get rid of the mass of the moon and then we can kind of cancel out one of the R's on that side, and this R. And so if we solve for the, uh, well, there's a couple of different things we can solve for. 
Uh, so we already have the velocity by itself. So if we took the square root, we would get that the velocity is g m earth over r. And now I haven't put in a value for r, but in the situation that we were working on, it was this distance between the center of mass of, mass of the earth and the center of mass of the moon. But this mass or this radius could be the radius of whatever object is orbiting 